for this coming year. And one thing that they do is uh, provide the funding for the power packs for, we hope, 20 Lily Elementary students again this year. If you can make an extra donation toward that goal, it will be greatly appreciated. There are envelopes in the pew bags uh, that you can use for that and just drop it in the offering plate. Next Sunday, the choir will meet in the choir room at 9.15. Uh, and any of you that have thought that maybe you'd like to join the choir, this would be the time. Because we're starting fresh. And in the beginning, I think we're only going to be leading the hymn singing. So it's going to be easy peasy to get started. So if, you think, if you've ever thought about it, come and join us at 9.15 on Sunday. Remember that uh, we have those bookmarks in the back of every pew. If you've given online, which several of our members are doing, uh, this gives you something that you can drop in the plate so that you are not letting it pass and not do anything with it. And there are QR codes on that bookmark that you can use to access the website and also the online giving. Uh, entry. All this is in your bulletin, so take it home. Keep the announcements. Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, please stand uh, for the call to worship. Psalm 93, verses 1 and 2. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is robed in strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from the world. You are our everlasting. Please remain standing as we sing hymn number six. Great day by the people. <laughs>
Compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Colorado for three weeks, and mom is being left in at both hands of the neighbors. So, all right, I need some prayers on that part. Well, let's pray together. Indeed, Father God, we're thankful uh, for this day that of all the places where we could be this morning, you have brought us here not by accident but by divine providence and divine grace. We're thankful for the opportunity to be able to worship you in spirit and in truth, to come before your throne and look at Christ in all of his glory and splendor and to remember uh, what uh, was purchased on the cross for all of us, that uh, Christ bore the sins of the world in his body, our sin, so that we could go free. We stepped in to the courtroom of life, and the judge was about to 
hammer down this gavel. And justice was going to be served when someone we didn't even know stepped in and said, no, judge, give me the penalty so that they can go free. Lord, what an amazing exchange that was. Lord, as we come to you this morning, humbly in prayer, we, we think of uh, John McCain and his, uh, and his family, Lord, and, and uh, the loss of, of a husband and father and grandfather, Lord, and we um, pray that you'd be with that family, that uh, Jesus Christ would, would show himself mighty, uh, that you would cover that family with grace, Lord, and peace. That, Lord, they might uh, be able to remember all the wonderful times they had with him, Lord, and that uh, you would just uh, bring a peace that would surpass all human understanding. Lord, I'm thankful this morning even for um, Pastor Ted and for the opportunity to, uh, to be with this congregation in this manner today. I pray for, for Ted and Polly as they're away. I pray that you bring them back safely. Lord, uh, and thank you for his faithfulness, for his faithful uh, ministry uh, over this year, year plus now. Lord, I pray that you bless him in, uh, in everything that he continues to do. Lord, we're thinking of this pending trip uh, to Colorado and uh, the fact that family's going to be left behind. And I pray, Lord, that you would give caregivers a greater grace, Lord, that, that nothing would go wrong, that you would... Uh, around that family with, with care, Lord, and that uh, all would be well while loved ones are away. Lord, we're thankful uh, for the opportunity to serve here over these four years, and we pray, Lord, that uh, you would go before us and make a straight path even for, for me, for my family, and we're, uh, we praise you and, and we thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to be here for these years, and what a joy it's been. Lord, we're most thankful for the sin debt you paid for us, and we remember the prayer that you taught us now, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and we forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And we us not into temptation, but deliver us
God for you. You have chosen the poverty of the world to make your people rich in faith. Help us to put our faith into practice through the offering of our lives, giving food to the hungry, clothes to the naked, and shelter to the poor. All for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord, your word made flesh. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing hymn number 456, my Jesus, I love thee. Well, when I was thinking and praying about what I teach for this particular Sunday, a series of verses from Paul's letter to the Philippians were the first verses that came to my mind. Can you imagine receiving a letter from the Apostle Paul addressed to you personally? After all, Paul was the preeminent teacher and spiritual leader of the day. The believers at Philippi must have been very excited when this letter was delivered to them. It was a personal letter to the saints in Jesus Christ at Philippi. And very few churches in history have ever received such a letter. But far from being some ancient letter from some bygone generation, this letter is as relevant today as it was then. It's applicable to every church and every generation. This letter, like all of the Bible, represents God speaking to each one of us today. Though penned 2,000 years ago, 
This book of the Bible has been preserved for our spiritual benefit. The verses we're about to look at from Philippians are for you and me in the present day. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and open it to Philippians and chapter 1. It can be found in the New Testament portion of the pew Bible in front of you, although I don't have the exact page number. I'm going to start reading uh, in verse 1 for context, and I'm going to read Philippians chapter 1 from verse 1 through verse 7, and then we'll pray together. Philippians, in chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, here's the greeting, Paul says this, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Let's pray. Indeed, Father God, what a wonderful text to read from your word, speaking about thankfulness and remembrance and the gospel. Lord, I pray that this text would pierce our hearts anew this morning, that we might see Christ in <coughs> all his fullness, Lord, that we might be changed individuals, that the word of God would cut deep, Lord, and I pray that it might bless us, Lord, in our walk with you. <coughs> Go before us and honor your own name, in Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> well, I believe that all of you are aware already but I want to remind you this morning that being involved in church ministry can be very challenging. You can be a pastor, elder, deacon, children's Sunday school teacher, music director, and all of these roles require you to be resilient. People in ministry must have that rare combination of thick skin and a tender heart. Someone with a sense of purpose and direction, yet someone who is sensitive toward the needs of people. And this was precisely the Apostle Paul. Ten years before he penned this letter, Paul came to Philippi on a second missionary journey. And he preached the gospel. And many were converted to Christ, and a church was birthed. A permanent bond of affection was established in his heart for the church at Philippi. He would go on to plant other churches, but he had a special affection for this one. Ten years after establishing this church, Paul was in prison in Rome, and he writes this letter. He's about 800 miles from Philippi. He's in a jail, and he decides to pen a letter expressing his love for the Philippian congregation. The context of the verse we're about to, verses we're about to look at represent essential aspects of any pastor's heart when trying to express the love he has for a congregation. Let's look together at verses 3 and 4. This is Paul's thankful heart. He says this, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. With these two verses, Paul's saying, Philippians, I have you on my mind. Notice Paul isn't rebuking false teaching. He's not <coughs> correcting bad behavior. He does that in other letters, but not here. He's trying to get the point across to them and to us today. Look, when I think of these dear Philippian people, Thanking God for them. 
thanks God for them, thinks of them, and thanks God. He does not say, I thank God, but rather, I thank my God. Because this was his God. This speaks of assurance and intimacy. God was not at a distance for Paul. He was close. He was his father's friend. He's in prison. It's not exactly a joyful place, yet he is joyful because of what God has done in his life. God transformed his life. In verse 4, we look at Paul's joyful spirit, his joyful spirit. He writes this. Always, in every prayer of mine, for you all, making my prayer with joy. Look, Paul is interceding before God on behalf of the Philippian church. A thankful heart and intercessory prayer should characterize all of us, every one of us. When you pray for someone else where you're diverted from your own problems and your own issues, and you're diverted into the lives of others. One pastor writes this quote, the passions of a pastor's heart will come out in his prayers. If you examine what you pray for and find you're praying only for your needs, problems, questions, and struggles, that is an indication of where your heart is, end quote. Paul says here that when he prays for this congregation, it plain makes him happy. He makes his prayer with joy, says the text. Notice that Paul has not made a single comment yet about his own feelings. He hasn't talked about his own frame of mind. But when he does, he says that his frame of mind is one of joy. Oh, why does it matter? Why does it matter today? It matters today, beloved, because Paul is trying to get the revelation across that fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ will triumph over all adversity. Fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ will triumph over all adversity. Paul's tone here would honestly lead one to believe that he must have been attending some feast or celebrating some wonderful occasion at, at the home of some of his friends. Instead, the truth is that Paul is in fact chained up to a Roman soldier and quite possibly waiting to be executed. Yet because of his relationship to Jesus Christ, the text says that he's joyful. Incidentally, joy is one of the major themes that runs through this entire epistle. One pastor has rightly said, J dot O dot Y dot stands for Jesus, yourself, Jesus, others, and yourself. If you have these letters in the wrong order, if the Y is in the place of the J, you will be a rather unhappy, joyless individual. J O Y, Jesus others yourself. Paul wants each of us to have a supernatural joy. And this supernatural joy is only possible for those who have repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and have been born again. If you want to experience true joy, you have to be born again. Coming to church won't get anyone to heaven. Repentance and faith in Christ and Christ alone is the only way to get there. We're about to see the unwavering focus of the Apostle Paul. He's going to look at his imprisonment as a new opportunity to advance the good news. And Paul is reminded of the joint partnership in the spread of the gospel. In this verse, we're about to see Paul's gospel focus, his gospel focus, verse 5. Because of your partnership, in the gospel from the first day until now. The key word here is partnership. Or some translations say participation or fellowship. In the Greek, the word is koinonia. It means to share something in common with another person. The partnership occurs when two or more people become involved in a joint venture. Think of Peter, Andrew, James, and John. These four were partners in a fishing business. Quite literally, they were in the same boat together. And though separated by many miles, Paul remained in koinonia, in partnership with the congregation in the spread of the gospel message to the world. And in the same manner, I might no longer be 
with this congregation each Sunday, serving you as its minister of music, but our partnership in the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ will continue. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon writes this, quote, The apostle longed to spread the gospel, so did they. He was earnest to carry it to regions beyond, so were they. If he preached, they would be there to encourage him. If he held a special meeting, they were ready to help. If money was required, every man was ready according to his means without pressing. Each one felt as earnest about the work as he did as did his minister. They were enthusiastic for the furtherance of the gospel. They were heartily with him, where he most valued their sympathy. End quote. True fellowship with Christ and with other believers means more than just enjoy enjoying each other's company. It's a mutual sharing of all aspects of our lives. It's a sharing that's permanent because our shared eternal life is permanent. We will worship around the throne of Jesus Christ forever and ever together one day. Believers belong to each other in a mutual partnership produced, produced by faith in Jesus Christ. The job of Laley Presbyterian Church and any church for that matter is in communion with other believers to take the gospel message to four corners of the earth. You have thousands of people right in this town who have retired here, spending their days golfing and eating out and collecting seashells, and none of these things are bad in and of themselves. However, many of these people only give mere lip service to the God of the Bible. And guess what? All of you can and must be armed with the message of the gospel. There's no salvation found in golf. There's no salvation found in seashells. But there is salvation in a person whose name is Jesus Christ. Several weeks ago, Laura and I attended the funeral of a mother, of the mother of a very close friend. It was a sudden death, and it came as a shock to everyone. The lady who died was a born-again believer. I remarked to my wife that it was one of the most evangelical, gospel-centered, encouraging funerals I had ever attended in my life. A few days later, some people who attended the same funeral, who are not believers, said to the daughter who just lost her mom, Hey, that funeral was really confusing. I couldn't figure out why so many people were smiling and joyful at a funeral. I was really puzzled. And in that moment, God flung open a door for this grieving daughter to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And to offer something that everyone in the entire world wants. She offered hope. People in the world are looking for hope. That's what they want. Funerals can and should be joyful. Why? Because, beloved, this world is not our home. That's why. We're aliens here. We're aliens longing for a heavenly home where we will worship Jesus Christ around his throne forever. In our next verse, verse 6, this verse is going to reveal Paul's confident hope. His confident hope. The text says, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. You remember that in verse 5, Paul reflects on the beginning of God's work among the Philippians. It is therefore not surprising that Paul would turn his attention to the day when that work was going to be complete. Paul's expressing his confidence in knowing that God will complete the work. And Paul takes hold of a positive certainty about their future. The good work used here is speaking about when they became born again by God. The work began when Paul first preached the gospel to them. The time when God ripped the scales off of their eyes and they saw themselves as helpless rebels in need of a savior. God opened their hearts and they embraced Christ and believed in Christ with their whole heart. And Paul's telling them, and he's telling us this day, look, whatever God begins, God is going to complete. 
Whatever God begins, God will complete. Salvation doesn't occur by human achievement, but rather through divine accomplishment, through what Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and me. If you sit here this morning, as a born-again believer, rest assured that God is going to complete this work in you all the way to the day of Jesus Christ, says this text. Paul's point here is when a man is involved, things are often left unfinished. That unfinished sandcastle on the beach, that unfinished painting, that unfinished manuscript you've been working on for years, that half-built house that you pass every day, all of these are reminders of our human tendency to leave things undone. But it's not so with God. God always finishes what he starts. God leaves nothing undone. Every single masterpiece, every single trophy of his grace, that's us, planned in eternity past and begun in time, will be brought to fulfillment in eternity future. The day of Jesus Christ in verse 6 has the idea of the second coming of Jesus and our resurrection in him. Dr. Stephen Lawson writes this quote, As a believer in Jesus Christ, you are as certain of heaven as though you have already been there 10,000 years. God finishes what he starts. End quote. Paul is about to wrap up this section of scripture with an expression of deep affection for the church at Philippi. Verse 7 reveals Paul's affectionate love, his affectionate love. Verse 7 says this, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Paul says, look, it's right for me to think or to feel this way about you all. I hold you in my heart. His thankfulness, his joy, his prayers for them were right because he remembers the fact that this church stood with him in various times of trial for the gospel. He uses the term all here to show just how large-hearted he was toward them. Paul, just like any faithful pastor, has a duty and a responsibility to treat every believer as a trophy of grace. There was no hierarchy in Paul's congregation. The church at Philippi and Paul received the same grace of God and salvation. It was the same grace granted by God through Jesus Christ. So he says, you're all partakers of me with grace. Like two pieces of metal that are welded together, Paul is glued to them by an unbreakable spiritual bond. <coughs> and he writes this, both in my imprisonment, meaning when I was bound in chains, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. It's simply astonishing to think that Paul wrote seven books of the Bible while physically chained and shackled to a Roman guard. Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, 1, 2, Timothy, Titus, Philemon. They're all termed the prison epistles. As I was studying this passage this week, I thought about all the petty little things that get under my skin in daily life. How much of our lives do we complain, we get annoyed, we get irritated because we do not get our own way? It's absolutely laughable, isn't it? It's laughable when you put it in the context of the Apostle Paul and what he went through for Jesus Christ and his church. He wrote seven books of the Bible because of his love for Christ and for the followers of Christ, all the while chained to a Roman guard. Nothing was going to deter Paul from proclaiming the gospel, and he would not let anything compromise his testimony for Jesus Christ. This morning, we've discussed Paul's thankful heart, his joyful spirit, his gospel focus, his confident hope, his affection and love. All rooted in his love of Christ and his love of the church. Lately, Presbyterian Church, 
in the future, you can rest assured that when I think of this place, when my wife does what our kids do, we'll say this, I thank God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. We're thankful for the time we've spent, we've spent with you. It's been joy. And serving the Lord here has made a singular impression on our family. We ask that you pray for us and we know that and know that we will be praying for you. It was four years ago. On a late July afternoon, when Jim Kirk knocked on my front door. And he offered me a job. To this day, I consider Jim to be one of the best bosses I've ever had. With Pastor Ted coming in a close second. I will especially miss the relationships I've built here. Especially those with the choir. The bell choir. Keep focused on Christ. Keep preaching the gospel. Keep God's word central. Keep loving each other. Call a full-time pastor who can teach, who can lead, and be a loving shepherd to the flock. I'm going to close with a quote from a song. One of my favorite songs. It's called For Good, For Good. The last line of the song. Perfectly, perfectly sums up my feelings about you all. The words are these. Because I knew you, I have been changed for good. Let's pray. Indeed, Father God, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful for the fact that it cuts to the heart, that it changes us, it, it makes us conform to the image of Christ. Lord, I pray that uh, you would be with this congregation, Lord, as they move forward and calling a new pastor, calling a new music director, Lord. Lord, you know the issues they're experiencing, Lord, and I pray that you would show yourself mighty, that you would work in this congregation, in and through every one of them, Lord, and that although they might not see the end, how it's all going to work out, Lord, I'm confident that you've begun a work here and you're going to bring it to full completion. Lord, I'm thankful for each and every one within the sound of my voice, Lord. Pray that you be continue to be honored and glorified here. We thank you and praise you for everything, every good and perfect gift. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we see as we see the apostles creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and murdered. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. The resurrection of God and the life of the blessed. Amen. Please turn to.